Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. So in this video, we are going to discuss Geeks for Geeks problem of the day and today's problem is shortest prime path and it is a medium level problem. So the problem says that we have been given two four digit numbers. The first one is num1 and the second one is num2. We have to find the distance of the shortest path from one, num1 to num2. Now in each operation, we can change any single digit and we have to change it in such a way such that the final resulting number is also a four digit prime number with no leading zeros. So basically there are a couple of things that we need to take care of in this particular statement. Let's say we have 1033, right? The very first thing is we cannot change the first digit to zero because in that particular case, it will be let's say 033. It is going to be a two digit number in this particular case. And if let's say it was one here, it is going to be a three digit number, which is anyways smaller than four digits, right? So with the very first thing is we cannot change the first digit. Now in one operation, we can change any of those digits such that the resulting is a four digit number. That means you cannot change this to zero, but you can change it to some other number, let's say eight. And this final number should also be a prime number. This is the second condition, right? These are the two conditions that we need to take care of. So now uh, we have to find the uh, like uh, minimum number of operations required to reach starting from here to reach at this particular ending number. And if there does not exist any answer, we have to return minus one. So the very, very, very first task is to find all the prime numbers and find all the possible states, right? Now, if you understand this problem, this problem is very similar to BFS, right? I'll explain you how this is BFS, but you will encounter a lot of problems like these, which can solve with BFS or by modeling the current problem into a graph problem, right? This uh, will actually come with more and more practice when you will realize that this problem, this kind of problem is of BFS. In this uh, problem, they actually gave itself away. They said somewhere, we have to find the shortest path, right? As soon as they say shortest path, graph is the first thing that might strike your mind. Instead, if they would have written, you have to find the minimum number of operations, then it would have taken some time for you to realize that it's a graph problem, right? But it will only come with practice that you will be able to identify that this problem can be solved with graph. Now let us understand uh, how are we actually going to solve this problem with BFS. So our very first task will be to find all prime numbers, right? To find all prime numbers. Starting from the first four digit number till the last four digit number, right? In this range, we have to find the prime numbers. You can take any method you like, right? The overall complexity, let's say if I take C, it is n log log n log log n, right? So in this particular case, the value of log will be this uh, 10,000, right? Now, if you don't want to use C, you can also take uh, some uh, like uh, a square root method, which is the basic method for checking if a number is prime or not. You can run it in this particular range. So there are exactly, let's say 9999 plus one minus 1000, right? So there will be 9,000 numbers in this particular range, right? Now for all those numbers, each of those operations will take root n times, right? So you can take this much amount of time to find all the prime numbers, which I believe should definitely work, right? So for this particular part, you can take any of the methods. Obviously, C is the more efficient one. So we are going to use that here, right? Now, once you have found all the prime numbers, these prime numbers, let's say P1, P2, P3, P4, P5 and so on, right? All of these prime numbers are individual nodes. We have to represent them as individual nodes, right? Now, once we have established this particular fact that these prime numbers are individual nodes, our second task is to add the edges or to identify what are all the other states I can go from my current states, right? So basically, when we want to add edges, there are four places with us. At the first place, I can place any number from 1 to 9. At the second place, I can place any number from 0 to 9. Again, 0 to 9. And then finally, 0 to 9. Right. I will have my current prime number, let's say Px. I want to find the next prime number Py. What I will do is, I will try to place all of these numbers at the first, second, third and fourth positions respectively. Whatever new number I get, I will try to figure out whether it is a valid or not. How will I figure out whether, whether it is a valid node? It The new number that I have just created should be a prime number, only then it is a valid node, right? So if the new number that I created after replacing one of these positions is a prime number, then 
my simple BF starts. If let's say I created a new prime number PY, if distance of PY is greater than distance of PX plus 1, then I need to update the distance of distance of PY is equal to distance of PX plus 1 and then push PY into the queue and push Q dot push PY. Right. So, this part is just simple BFS. The only hard part was about modeling the problem and identifying that this is a graph problem, but the problem statement itself gave it away when they said shortest path. So, anyways, this part is the more difficult part where you have to figure out this is the graph problem and how you are mod and how you are going to model the graph. Once you have modeled the graph completely, you have identified the nodes which are all the prime numbers, you have identified the edges which are just changing all of these numbers into different values and then after that, you can perform this simple BFS. So, in case you don't know BFS, uh, let me just give you a very high level idea of what we do in BFS. But we are like, uh, we are going to stick to the main problem itself. If you want to study about BFS, you can just watch some other video on the internet. Right. So, let's say, uh, what I do generally do is BFS is, I will have a start pointer and an end position. Right. The most important path about BFS and what differentiates it from a Dijkstra's algorithm Dijkstra's is nothing but a specialized BFS is that in BFS every edge is either is only going to be of one unit length or every edge is going to be of the same length. So, in this case we are just going to assume unit length right. Now, what we do is we initialize all the distance let us say distance from 1 to n all of them with infinity distance of start node should be equal to 0 and I just push my start node into my queue right. Now, what I do is while my queue is not empty while my queue is not empty, I am going to I am going to take the front node from the queue, queue dot front and pop the front element from the queue. Now I am going to visit all the children of this from this of this particular node. Right. Now if okay, if distance of child is greater than distance of node plus one. I just update the distance of child as distance of node plus 1. I will explain you uh, what I am doing, but just now I am just typing all the important things. So, let me just introduce this here and then this here and then this here. Now, at the end, if distance of ending that is the final position that we want is equals to infinity, that means there is no path, there is no path, right. Otherwise, distance of n will be my final answer. So, what we are exactly doing here is we have a starting node let us say right right here. Now, all the nodes that are connected to this particular starting node right all the nodes that are connected to this particular starting node what can be their distance? Their distance will be the starting node plus this unit length that is the distance of the starting node plus 1 right. So, this is the distance of start node plus 1. Similarly, for all the other nodes, that is exactly what I am doing at this particular position, right. But we only have to do it if the distance of that particular child is greater than this particular value. Let us say there was, let us say, this is a node, this is a node and this is a node and then we have nodes like this, right. So, when I start my BFS, you will see this is the start node, let us say, the distance of this node will be 1, the distance of this node will be 2, 1. And then the distance of this node, I you can either go from here to here or from here to here will be 2. Now, the this node is connected to this particular node, right. It is still connected to this bottom node. But if I try to go from 2 to 1, you will see that this distance is already smaller. So, we do not need to modify it, right. So, the basic idea is only when we need to modify it, we are going to change the distance of the child and then push it back into the queue so that it can modify the distance of all of its neighbors. Now, one interesting part about like uh, this BFS is that as soon as you encounter your final node, right. So, let me just write it. So, if child, child is equal to, equal to n, you can just directly return your distance of child, right. So, this is, this is only applicable in BFS, it does not work in Dijkstra because in Dijkstra all the edges are different, right. Here, since all the edges are same you will see all the nodes that are present at distance 0 will get processed first and then all the nodes which are present at distance 1 will get processed and then all the nodes which are distance which are at distance 2 will get processed and so on right. So, in BFS only you can do this particular thing 
that if your child is equals to your end pointer or your ending position, you can just return the distance of a child, right? So this was all an overview idea of BFS. You can obviously watch some other video to understand BFS in depth and if you're studying it for the very first time, right? So now let us have a look at the code, what I've done. So as you can see, the very first thing what I've done is if num1 is equals to num2, that means if both the numbers are the same, I'm just going to turn zero from here. It's just like a base case, right? Now I have this particular thing here. If not computed, I'm going to call C. So what is this thing? I've created a Boolean variable computed which is basically going to store whether I have done the pre-computation of creating the sieve or not, right? So if I've already done the computation, I'm not going to run this part again, but if it is not computed, I'm just going to call sieve, right? So uh, when I call sieve at the end, you see I mark computed as one. So I'm doing this because if geeks for geeks has some test cases, uh, let me just check. So you can see this, uh, this clearly has multiple test cases. So that means this solve function will be called multiple times. I don't want my sieve to get initialized those many number of times, right? So that is why I have this particular computed variable. After my sieve work is done, I'm going to mark it as true. So the next time this particular solve function is called my, this, this is going to be false. This hole is going to be false and this is not going to be called, right? So inside the sieve function, it's just very basic sieve till here. It's just a standard sieve thing. And uh, if you want to know more about sieve, it is, uh, you can find it on the internet. I'm not going to explain this particular part because I want to focus more on this particular problem, right? But you can just uh, understand this, that uh, this whole part will give me this prime vector, which is a Boolean vector. All the positions which are prime will contain true and all the positions that are not prime will contain false. This is what the task of this particular C function is and it is going to run in n log log n, right? Now, I'm going to go through all the numbers that are setting from 1000 and less than n plus 1. What is n? It is 9999, right? So basically all the four digit numbers, I'm traversing through them. And if it is prime, I'm just going to push back into my primes vector. So primes is a collection of all the primes and it is storing them in string format. So the only reason I'm storing it in string format is because string manipulation is easier than numbers manipulation, integers manipulation. And that is why I'm going to be using string throughout this particular problem. So you can see I've declared string of primes here and all the prime numbers will now be stored in this particular prime vector. So now when I come here inside my function, what I've done is I've created a map of string comma integers called distance. So it is D. Now I'm going through all the primes inside the prime vector, which I've calculated through the sieve. Now distance of Y is going to be infinity. So basically I'm storing all the states. Now I'm going to start set my start as the num1 converted into string. Similarly, the end as the num2 converted into string. Now my distance of start is going to be zero and I'm going to create an empty queue of strings and I'm going to push my start into my queue. So while my queue is not empty, I'm just going to get the frontmost element and pop this element from the queue. Now for all the four positions, I'm traversing through all the four positions and I'm going through all the characters that are possible starting from zero to nine. The only difference is if i is equals to zero, I want to start from one, otherwise I want to start from zero, right? So I've put a ternary condition from here. For, for the starting element for j. If i is equal to 0, I want to start from 1, otherwise I can start from 0, right? While j is less than equal to the character 9, I'm just going to do j++, right? So if j is not equal to current of i, that means it might happen that the first position has 2 and I'm trying to replace it with 2 again, right? I don't want to do that. So I am going to check whether it is not equal to the current character, right? If it is not equal to the current character, I'm going to start initialize my next string as current and set next of i as j. Right, so i is the position, j is the character. Now I'm going to try to find this particular index in the distance vector. So you see that uh, I only want the prime numbers to be one of the states. So if I create a number which is not prime, then definitely it should not be part of the graph nodes. So I first check whether it is present in my distance vector or not. It should be present in my distance vector because I pushed all the prime numbers into the in that particular distance vector. Right. So if pointer is not equal to d dot n, that means this particular number next is present in my map and pointer dot second, which is the distance represented by that particular node is greater than distance of current plus one. Then I'm going to update this particular distance as distance of current plus one and just push next into my queue. Now, if next is equal to n, I can just directly return my distance of next from here. Remember again, you cannot do this particular thing if the edges have different weights or you're using the extra algorithm with different weights. But if you're using BFS, all which where all of them have the same width, you can do this thing where if you in the first position when you encounter this particular end element, you can just directly return your answer from here, right? And at the end, if you do not find your answer, you can just return minus one. 
So this was the whole solution of this particular problem. Let me just quickly submit this and show you that this particular solution works and this code is absolutely correct. So we will just wait for it to finish. So you see this passes all the test cases and this solution is absolutely correct. I hope that you guys were able to understand the solution. I know there are a lot of things which I have not explained that is does this see particular path and BFS in detail. I believe that uh, I wanted to be more focused on this particular problem. You can study those things anywhere on the internet. So that is it for this particular video. I hope that you guys were able to understand the solution, understand the whole idea behind this problem. Even though if you are not familiar with BFS, you will be able to get a high level idea of how we are trying to solve this particular problem. If you did, then consider dropping a like on this video and don't forget to share thoughts in the comments because your engagement with this particular video really, really helps the YouTube algorithm to understand that this video is actually helpful for you and it will be able to reach much more people like you who want to keep solving new problems. So that is it for today. Till the next video drops, keep coding, stay safe. Bye-bye.